Okay. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's program on Hong Kong. My name is Abby Newman, and I'm Associate Director of the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Chicago. We are pleased to be kicking off the 13th annual University of Chicago International Education Conference webinar series on democracy in recession. This series and related conference is co-sponsored by the University of Chicago Center on Democracy, Neighborhood Schools Program, Center for East Asian Studies, the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies, and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies with generous support from US Department of Education, Title VI National Resource Center grants. For more information on upcoming webinars and educator workshops, please visit the link in the UChicago, I'm sorry, please visit the link to the UChicago Educator Outreach website provided in the chat box. For more information on the University of Chicago Center for East Asian Studies, please visit us at our website, ceas.uchicago.edu, where you can subscribe to receive our weekly e-bulletin. These links are also provided in the chat box. Now, before we begin, I would like to mention a couple of additional house or Zoom keeping notes. This event will consist of approximately 45 minute presentation, followed by a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question to be addressed during tonight's Q&A portion of the program, please type your question in the Q&A box. This is where all questions should be entered. For those Illinois educators from public schools who would like to receive professional development units for this event from the Illinois State Board of Education, please email your request to me, Abby Newman, and I will then follow up with specific instructions and paperwork. My email address is provided in the chat box. For any educators who would like to receive a generic certificate of completion from the University of Chicago for participating in the activities that are part of our International Education Conference Series, we ask that you email Connie Yip with your request. Her contact information is also provided in the chat box. Please note that we will process and prepare these UChicago certificates the week of November 9th after all of our IEC activities are done. Finally, the University of Chicago Center for East Asian Studies vigorously upholds the principle that diverse perspectives should be actively represented, facilitated, and protected in its academic, campus, and outreach activities. The center takes no official position on any issue. Rather, the center strives to be a forum for the open, responsible, and informed exchange of ideas and information among students, faculty, staff, and members of the general public. We look forward to fostering civil dialogue and exchange about challenging and sometimes contentious issues across disciplines. Now, on to our program. Tonight, we welcome Victoria Hui, Associate Professor of Political Science from the University of Notre Dame, to speak on Hong Kong in a talk entitled, How Beijing Has Killed Hong Kong's Freedom and Democracy and why American students should care. Professor Hui received her PhD in political science from Columbia University and her Bachelor of Social Science in Journalism from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her core research examines the centrality of war in the formation and transformation of China in the long span of history. She also studies contentious politics and Hong Kong's democracy movement. She has testified at Congress and she has written for Foreign Affairs, The Journal of Democracy, Washington Post Monkey Cage, The Diplomat, and many other channels. For more information about Professor Hui and her research, please feel free to visit her website and blog. Both links are provided in the chat box. Professor Hui, Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to your presentation. Abby, thank you so much um, for having me. So I guess everyone's hearing okay, right? 
Perfect. And um, I do not really use PowerPoint because I still feel that it's much better that you guys are actually looking at me rather than looking at some slides. Uh, when, you know, when it's in person, we can actually look at simultaneously looking at slides and, and the human face. But here, I just prefer that, you know, we have still have this kind of like distance, but still personal touch. And uh, these days I've been talking a lot. So if now and then I reach out to Mins, don't, you know, just want you to say this ahead of time so you don't feel that it is awkward and weird. And then um, what I'm actually say, going to say, a lot of it is based on an article that I just published in the Journal of Democracy, uh, Tiananmen 2.0. And um, at the same time, I'm also hoping to develop this into a larger project. So, so let me actually then just get going. Now, it is really great to have to be able to talk to educators and especially if we, you know, if we're trying to relay the message to um, students, grade school students and, and, and high school students, how do you even ex begin to explain to them? I think what my doctor told me is great because when I went to see her, she's like, how are you doing? I said, these days life is really horrible. What's been going on in Hong Kong? And she said, you know, Hong Kong is a global city. It is an international city. Whatever happens in Hong Kong, we should all care about it. Mm -hmm. and I think this is a good way to get it started is that Hong Kong really is an international city. It is ranked third as a finan international financial center only after New York and London. So imagine if one, one day that the New York City is taken over, for example, by Moscow, and how would that go? This is in a way how Hong Kong people feel today, that their international city has been taken over by Beijing. Now, it is also important to see Hong Kong in the context of some recent protests, because I think a lot of Americans are not very aware of what is going on in Hong Kong. Now, these days in the last week, we've been seeing protests in Thailand. And then for Hong Kong people, we were just stunned that uh, Thais, they borrow so many tactics from Hong Kong, from umbrellas to the idea of be water, that you take the, the, the subway train and, and go protest and every single stop along the way. And then the authorities, because of that, they shut down all the, the train service and the tear gas and, and, and also the attempts to impose emergency. What is different is that uh, just yesterday or earlier, um, uh, in, in our, uh, North American time, that the prime minister announced that they were, he was going to lift the state of emergency. This is a huge success on the part of the protesters. Now let's also turn to Belarus. Just not very, very long ago, just in, within the last month, that people in Belarus were also protesting nonstop for many weeks and with very immense determination against um, this rigged elections by, by Lukashenko. Well, Lukashenko then decided that, well, if I don't get legitimacy from you guys, that's fine. I can go turn around and go to Moscow. With Putin's backing, then he could sway himself in quietly and continue to beat people up, lock people up and silence dissent. So Hong Kong is an even a more extreme case. It is literally, Beijing taking over Hong Kong and imposing the national security law, which in a way is really the Hong Kong version of state of emergency. So another thing too is that the national security law, so how bad it is, it was imposed on, on Hong Kong on June 30th. It was bad in multiple ways in terms of the procedure because the Hong Kong basic law stipulates that Hong Kong, the Hong Kong legislature should enact a national security law on its own. But this law was imposed on Hong Kong by Beijing. And then it was, and in Hong Kong, when you draft a law, you will have months and months of consultation. You have to publish the white paper, you have to table it for the first reading, the second reading before it is voted on uh, uh, with the, uh, in the third reading. And then you also have to have two equally valid version, English and Chinese. This national security law was imposed on Hong Kong at the 11th hour, exactly 11 o'clock PM on June 30th. And only the Chinese edition 
was issued. And so far, there's no uh, authentic English version, only translation, working translation. Essentially, so then the regime said that uh, we don't, we are, we are not ruling out, we're not firing all these foreign judges, but how do we expect foreign judges to judge the cases of affecting national, the national security law when there's really no law that they can even follow? Now, the law says that it's, it, is, uh, it criminalizes several particular things, secession, subversion, terrorism, collusion. It is important that all these terms are so vaguely defined. For example, terrorism in particular, it is not just about people actually, um, you know, we're talking about not just like ISIS or Al Qaeda, that, that it also includes definitions such as um, people who set up roadblocks, then it also counts as terrorism. And it is not just about concrete actions. So setting up roadblocks is a, an action. The law also covers activity in the sense that people providing any kind of financial or material or, or any, any kind of support. If you donate money to a particular action that the, the authorities don't like, if you have conducted a training workshop, if you have taken um, a, given a ride to the person who's charged for terrorism, then you are also uh, subject to the same charges. So it really is about targeting at not just a small minority of people, troublemakers, but it's really targeted at free speech. So, so far, since the national security law was imposed on June 30th, what has happened? There have been about 28 related cases of arrest. But so far, there's only one person who's been formally charged under terrorism because on July 1st, this person, he had this flag, liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our times in his motorbike. And he ran his motorbike to three police officers. For that, he is formally charged for terrorism. And all the other cases of arrest, we don't even know what exactly the charges are. They just, we just know that they've been arrested uh, for violating the national security law. And the most notable example is Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai, he is the publisher of Hong Kong's only pro-democracy print newspaper, Apple Daily. He was arrested and then 200 police officers raided his office and they told not just uh, whatever uh, uh, documents from his own mm, mm, uh, chairperson's office, but also that the police went through all of those reporters' desks and collected information as well. They went, they, they, they walked away from the building with trolleys of uh, documents. And they arrested not just Jimmy Lai, but also four of his top executives and his two sons. And this is basically more or less we're getting into China's kind of prosecution when it is not just the person, the target that the regime doesn't like is arrested, but even other associates and family members can get into trouble as well. And then another, th another person that's very prominent is Andy Lee. He was formally charged under the national security law for collusion. And because he's one of those um, who have mobilized, raised money, and then um, in charge of putting huge ads in international newspapers or helping those Hong Kongers um, who were trying to, to leave Hong Kong, he himself got arrested. And then he, now he's one of the 12 who are now detained across the border in Shenzhen. So the, all these 12 people, they've all been arrested. They were all released on bail. And then knowing the consequences, they were trying to flee Hong Kong to Taiwan. Before them, there were many little groups, small groups like this in, uh, who succeeded in fleeing to Taiwan. But since this case, no one was there anymore. But what is really particularly alarming about this case, the 12, is not that they were just so unlucky to be intercepted by China's Coast Guard, but that now we have information that the police knew what they were doing because now in Hong Kong, every single activist is subject to 24 seven surveillance, that they have these, motive, uh, these vehicles or and, and office, officers looking people in plain, wear, uh, wearing plain clothes, but you see with the same group of people, they take shifts monitoring your activity, your in and out uh, all the time. 
in every single minute. So most likely that these 12 people were under surveillance and they also the communications which were, were also monitored. And they didn't know that the police knew that they were planning to escape. And then the police trapped them. Instead of stopping them from escaping, the police just let them drive out the boats out in, and then got them to be arrested by, by the, the Chinese Coast Guard. So this is an ex very extremely alarming case because last year, Hong Kong people protested against an, an extradition bill that people did not want to be taken across to the border for any kind of uh, criminal activities that, that, um, that we also know that Beijing doesn't like many actions and activities and therefore many things that would otherwise be illegal in Hong Kong would be, would be illegal in China. But now these, these uh, activists who were protesting against the bill, they have been taken across, they've been extradited to Shenzhen by the Hong Kong police, even without the assistance of such an extradition law. And then what else is also bad? Free speech. So on the first day, when people, they were displaying the, the, these um, protest slogans, revolution of our time, liberate Hong Kong, or five demands, not one less, they were arrested. And immediately then uh, also that the, the police said that these slogans are now bad. If you display them again, you're going to be subject to the national security law. So people are so upset that, okay, we don't really know what words are going to be bad or what words we're even allowed to say. They, within a week, they began to protest with blank sheets of paper. But even those people got arrested as well, not for violating the national security law, but for violating in general, uh, the public order ordinance. And also that these days in Hong Kong, you cannot really criticize the law anymore. You cannot really have any open debate about why it is bad. That would be that a lot of seminars that, for example, the Hong Kong University has con conducted the various seminars. But very often that when we listen to um, people still in Hong Kong, it's so hard for them to come out to criticize it because at one, either they, you know, they want to keep the job and therefore it's best not to say anything critical. Or then very often then what I've seen is that people will tend to just explain Beijing's position, why Beijing is doing this. So then, you know, you are referring to what other people said rather than what you yourself has to say. And on top of these, uh, on top of these 28 or so um, arrests under the national security law, since June 2019 last year, over 10,000 people have been arrested for protesting or for possession of weapons or for arson or for rioting for all kinds of charges under pre-existing laws. And also many thousands got injured. And then another person also got arrested lately that he, just because he was speaking the same uh, protest slogans, five demands, not one less, liberate Hong Kong revolution about times, then he got charged with a sedition law in 1938, colonial era sedition law. And then he was also charged for saying, they're saying these things before the, the national security law came into effect. So people are guessing that maybe the police wanted to charge him for things done before the implementation of the law. And so then they use a different law. But this also just goes to show that Hong Kong has inherited all of these draconian colonial era laws. Why do you really need a national security law? And then also another thing to keep in that I'm just going next to the next point is, in addition to these arrests and surveillance, under the new national security law and the pre-existing law, that there's also this kind of more behind the scene repression, whole society repression of different professions. And the best way to put this is to talk about the Hong Kong that I grew up in and the Hong Kong that is today. Hong Kong used to be called the city of protest. I used to joke that I was kind of like a serial protester because whenever I was in Hong Kong, I would go to protest every year on January 1st because it's the day to greet the new year, on June 4th to commemorate Tiananmen, on July 1st, 
that she commemorates the Hong Kong's handover to Beijing on October 1st um, to commemorate, to kind to celebrate the, the Chinese National Day. And this year, none of those protests could happen. First, the, the police in Hong Kong, if you want to organize any protest, you have to get a no objection permit from the police. If the police does not give you this no objection permit, then if you still go to protest, the organizers are, good, are vulnerable to um, uh, organizing, inciting, and participating in unlawful assemblies. And people have been charged and sentenced for that. And then this year, they got a much better excuse. Using COVID-19, this has to be social distancing rule. And so any, any day time that people gather to get, to, get, to get in the same place, then they are issued tickets, they are fined $2,000. And so that's essentially they have multiple ways to deny people the right to protest, which is enshrined in the Hong Kong basic law. Now the Hong Kong I grew up in, also that I, when I was a little girl, whenever we went out, um, my mother was always worried that she would lose uh, one of us. I had two other siblings. And my mom always wanted to hold my hand really tight, but then she only had two hands. And so one of us would, be, would just be walking around uh, on his or own or her own. And my mom would say, if you ever get lost, go get help from a police uncle or police. And that was the kind of trust that we had with our police officers when I was growing up. And today, people walk down the street, walk to the shopping mall, um, to, or go to a train station and you see police officers in full gear, in right gear, you'll be very worried that, you know, you may not even be protesting, you happen to be passing by, but you could get yourself into trouble. And then if they do think that they want to arrest you, they could jump on you, pin you down, smash your face to the ground. And when you have this bloody face, they spray pepper spray onto, on your wounds to make it even more painful. And in detention ten centers, you could be subject to even more torture. Many people emerge from detention centers with brain bleeding and broken bones. Um, and so this is a very different situation altogether. And also in the old days, the civil servants, you could expect them to be very impartial. That whatever beliefs that they held and whatever beliefs that you hold, it doesn't matter whether you, you support the government or you are one of the opposition leaders, you always be treated fairly but not anymore. Um, just very recently that the governments said that civil servants have to pledge allegiance to, to, to um, the authorities. Pledging allegiance is one thing, but they actually the subtext is that you have to do whatever we have we tell you. And then there have been civil servants who, who got arrested um, during protest, they are fired. So these days, it doesn't matter that you can, you're very competent, you can do your job right. But if you are caught as one of the protesters, you are caught to display a protest slogan. You are caught to have sent out an email asking your friends to go to, to show up at the protest. You could get fired. And teachers. So this is just why this is so important to be able to have a chance to talk to teachers like you guys. So when I was growing up, the teachers would, tell, would teach kids what happened in Tiananmen in China in 1989. And in order to learn the experience, go to the annual candlelight vigil at Victoria Park on June 4th in Hong Kong. And just very recently, one particular teacher, and he was preparing for some teaching materials as of March last year. In March last year, long before, months before the anti-tradition protests even started. At that particular time, the biggest issue of the day was that there was this Hong Kong Nationalist Party pro-independence, and it was banned by the government. So the teacher was like, okay, I'm just going to prepare for a unit on free, free speech. And he decided that we should show this uh, a clip from the radio television Hong Kong, is government-funded uh, station, 
And then in it, the, the chair of the Hong Kong Nationalist Party talk about why, what, why he's this stupid, what he do, was advocating. And then also the clips from other people who said that it was a bad idea that the ban was actually a good thing. And then students were asked, you know, what do you think about this? Just for doing that, preparing for the teaching materials. And he himself was not really involved in, the te in teaching the materials in the classroom. He recently got decertified and was also told that he could never put his staff into any schools for the rest of his life. And then also we have journalists. I mentioned that the Depo Daily, Jimmy Lai, uh, not just that his, his newspaper was raided, but also his personal office last week was raided as well. Apparently, the, gov the authorities are trying to fish for any kind of incriminating information that they could, lay, they could use to charge him under the national security law when they really do not even know what exactly gets done. That would kind of constitute a violation of the national security law. But in addition to that, again, that happened only a few, a few weeks ago that the police said we no longer recognize the accreditation conducted by Hong Kong's own journalist association. Now, if you guys want to be certified, you have to be, you pretty much have to be one of, one of the friendly pro, pro regime friendly media. And what happens now, if you are not certified, you can still go report and cover stories. But what happened these days is that if there's a protest, you go cover the protest, you take pictures, you interview people, right police swoop in. They immediately draw this big cordon line and anyone who is within the cordon line, if you can show that you are a certified reporter, then you are let go. But you're not, you're treated as one of the protesters and subject to arrest. So today, a lot of Hong Kong journalists are vulnerable to arbitrary arrest as well. And Judges, that's another area that's very scary. So these days we still have judges who would uh, release, they could be arrested because there's not enough evidence. In fact, in many of the cases, the police actually do not have concrete evidence that the arrested either possess weapons or have actually committed arson or have attacked assaulted police. And so quite a large number of cases are released. But at the same time, there are already a lot of loyalist judges who would convict people for, for possessing, for example, a lighter. They used to light a cigarette, you know, as which is because you have intention for social police. And there have also been even um, other cases when a, someone who is a baker and he had this baker's a rod, rolling roller, and also that is charged. And the authorities actually, knowing that the authorities know that some of these judges are not loyalist enough, that they're too professional, and they will acquit us a lot of these cases. This is why with the national security law, the regime are also setting up a special court with only the judges that they want to preside over those cases. And if you show any kind of any judges show any sign that of independence, then they can be dismissed from this special court. And I think also because of this, that I also have been making the arguments that, that the, the police have conducted a decapacitation de campaign against protesters because they know that even if they can arrest people, they take them to court, they provide the basically real or quotes of evidence. But in the end of the day, a lot of judges will, will just release a lot of these uh, people. And so how do you stop them from coming back out to protest? You break the bones. So how did we get to where we are today? The contrast between the Hong Kong that grew up in and the Hong Kong that we see today. How can the city descend into this situation so fast and so rapidly? I think and one thing that we want to keep in mind is that the national security law, despite its name, it should really be understood as the regime security law. It's all about the regimes in Beijing, its own kind, own sense of security. A lot of people would say that the national security law had to be introduced because the anti-extradition protests were getting out of hand. Well, the thing is, it was true last year, 
that the protests were escalating, escalating, and radicalizing. But after the November 24th elections of the, the uh, district councils, when the pro-democracy forces won in a landslide, controlling 17 out of 18 district councils, people were very convinced that, oh, if the ballot box is the way to go, is the, the ballot box can actually give us a voice. Let's do that. And many people channel their energies to talking about how they could then mobilize more support to win over the legislative council elections originally scheduled for September 6th of this year. But then by July, by the end of July this year, the regime first, they disqualified a whole bunch of candidates. And then within 24 hours, they said that we're just going to postpone the elections altogether, citing COVID-19. Now, if the regime actually can, organ can organize a lot of events in Hong Kong, including pretty much a, a, a universal uh, COVID test, making sure that the conducting actually as many um, stations, COVID testing sites as regular polling stations. And in fact, very often you think it's actually the same facilities. They did all that with success, but they claimed that with, with COVID-19, they had to postpone the elections. So no, really no one would buy that argument. So the point is that by the by the by early this year, the protests had really quieted down. That was just really no excuse that you know you had to introduce some very draconian measures to quiet down the the protest. And COVID nineteen also gave the regime another excuse, you know, allowing them to say that any time that we see more than four people, then they will be given tickets and subject to a fine. And another explanation that a lot of people have given is that, well, Beijing had to impose this national security law because um, the Hong, Hong Kong's own legislature refused to pass its own version beginning from 2003. So in 2003, that was six years into the Hanover. Hong Kong was returned to China in 1997. In the first few years, everything looked great. It looks like, you know, on the surface, everything looks the same as before. But by 2003, Beijing wanted the, the first chief executive of Hong Kong to impose, to pass a national security law. The problem with that law was, as a lot of lawyers in Hong Kong at the time saw it, it did not conform to the guarantees of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that's also stipulated in both the sign the British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. The regime, did this, the government decided that they were not going to bother with it because any, any kind of national security law that would conform to the ICCP EPCR apparently would not be good enough. So they didn't really bring in another attempt, make another attempt to bring a national security law back to the legislature. And also that really was an excuse in the sense that uh, early this year in May, the government had tried uh, through the last year to introduce a national anthem law because Hong Kong people were beginning to boo the national anthem at major sports events or des uh, um, desecrate the flag. And so, and so the, uh, the pro-democracy forces, they were trying to slow down that process for many months. And then the authorities decided that we are not going to tolerate this anymore. They kicked out the, uh, the pro-democracy legislatures and appointed their own guys. And that law was then, the national anthem law was then just passed within two weeks after they started to make these maneuvers. So Beijing actually could have used the same tactics to pass a pretty harsh version of a national security law in Hong Kong. So, I, so I've used fulfilling the letter, even though not the spirit of the basic law, you know, Hong Kong and Latin on its own in national security legislation. They didn't go through this path. They decided to impose their own version directly from Beijing. Partly because a version, however hard it, is, it, is, it was going to be, and, you know, shuffled, just being shuffled down the throat of the Hong Kong's own legislature, it would still not be as. Uh, as draconian as the one that we are seeing today, which allows not just uh, criminalization of the event of the of secession, secession, uh, terrorism, and all of these, 
but also now the current law allows Beijing secret police and national security forces to open up their offices in Hong Kong. And they also have the authority to decide whether some of these national security law cases can be tried in Hong Kong or should be taken across the border to Beijing. So my overall argument about how we got to where we are today, why things got so bad, is that actually the, Hong, the whole idea, the Hong Kong's constitutional structure, the white country to systems model, was kind of doomed from the start. Now, I still remember the days in the 1980s that during the, say, in the early 1980s, when Beijing and London were negotiating Hong Kong's future, Hong Kong people were not really consulted, but still, when the Sino British Joint Declaration came down, it was announced in 1984, there was a sense of relief. Oh, it's not so bad. It promises that everything is going to stay the same, that nothing else is going to change except for the change of the flag, that Hong Kong people can continue to live the way of life that we have always enjoyed, continue to enjoy all the freedoms, the rights to protest, the rights to say whatever you like, and, um, and then all these international treaties, the international covenants on political and civil rights would, would be, be uh, incorporated into Hong Kong law. So what is it to worry? And then the Joint Declaration also stipulates that all of these promises should be written into a Beijing, a Beijing's own and uh, basic law. And so there was actually, so I was uh, moving from high school to university at the time. I still remember a sense that, oh, we can write our future. And so the, the Hong Kong's democracy movement was actually born in, the, in about that time then when a lot of those professionals, they and, and uh, college student unions got together trying to map out a future for Hong Kong. The basic law was promulgated in 1990. The thing is something happened before that. 1989, Tiananmen. In June, after the crackdown in Tiananmen, Hong Kong people were protesting with the slogan, today is Tiananmen, tomorrow's Hong Kong. Hong Kong people use that slogan to think that if the Chinese Communist Party could shoot their own people today, what would they do to us tomorrow? So, Hong Kong people began to call for, okay, so it is one thing to say that we have promised that our own ways of life and our pre-existing freedoms will not be infringed on. This is one thing. But so long as Hong Kong does not have democracy, then those freedoms will not be guaranteed. We could actually lose them one, sooner or later. So the, uh, the democracy movement then became stronger in the sense that there is this common goal that Hong Kong needs democracy in order to preserve freedom. Beijing learned a different lesson. Because in May, 1.5 million Hong Kong people out of a population of 6 million poured to the street of Hong Kong, providing money and all kinds of material resources to support the students in China. Beijing got very worried that Hong Kong was going to be used as a subversive base against the regime. So after Tiananmen, their lesson from that event was, we know they have to really kill Hong Kong's democracy. And we, they didn't know what to do with Hong Kong's freedom, but this is something that they also would then learn that they will have to kill as well. So the basic law stipulates that the stipulates how the chief executive and the legislative council should be composed of for 10 years after the handover of 1997. This gave Hong Kong people the expectation that Hong Kong could become more democratic after 10 years. But then Beijing dashed the hole and, and introduced this decision that, well, you guys have to wait until 2017. And this is why the umbrella movement broke out in 2014 because at the time, Benny Tai and other people, other organizers were thinking, if we are going to have genuine universal suffrage in 2017, we need to begin our discussion now in 2014. And then Beijing issued a decision in August in 2014 saying that, yeah, you guys can have your one person, one vote, but we are going to control 
who the candidates are. We are going to control the nomination process. Only two to three people, candidates, could be, could be allowed to, to come out and, and run in the election. Hong Kong people denounced that as a fake uh, the democracy and demanded genuine universal suffrage. So the umbrella movement was shut down. And as a result, um, essentially from then on, there was just basically very little to hope for it, democracy. The problem for Beijing was Hong Kong people continue to enjoy freedoms, continue to enjoy the freedom to protest, continue to enjoy the freedom to demand democracy when Beijing has no intention to give Hong Kong people democracy and want to really shut it down, manipulate the pre-existing elections. And so the national security law in taking away Hong Kong's freedom to protest this is really the final solution to the long-standing problem that Hong Kong has all, always posed as kind of the sore in Beijing's eye. And I would also call that what we have seen in last year is kind of like a tenement-like crackdown. In late July, early August last year, the PLA garrison released these videos showing uh, riot drill in Hong Kong like urban setting. And the PIA also practiced live drills across the border in Shenzhen. At the time, I think both Hong Kongers and the rest of the world didn't take that too seriously. The reason was if Beijing were to really roll out military tanks into the streets of Hong Kong, that would mean the formal end of one country, two systems. And what that means also is that Hong Kong has been treated as a separate customs unit entity when it comes to trade and financial and economic issues. If Beijing ends Hong Kong's one country to system, that means the end of Hong Kong's autonomy. That would mean that the rest of the world would then also cut off all of the special privileges that Hong Kong enjoys and which Beijing has reaped tons and tons of profits from. Except that that calculation was kind of like both right and wrong at the same time. Right that Beijing care a lot about Hong Kong's special economic status. Wrong that Beijing would have to roll out the tanks to crack down on the protest. Because there are other tenement-like forms of crackdown. One was the fomentation of riots. One was you don't really need to use the military guys, but you can use regular security forces to beat people to death. Another point is parallel is to construct the truth that these uh, these protesters are all rioters, whereas the law enforcement agents agents they just there to re re restore order. And then another element is the imposition of amnesia. So this is why when I went as you said earlier that the Hong Kong police have launched a decapacitation campaign against protesters. The Hong Kong authorities like to say that they, you know, it, during all the months of protest, they haven't really killed one person. Now, we don't really know what happened to many cases of mysterious suicides or disappearances. But so we can just take the words that, you know, they haven't really, and then they are, the police have also shot life fire at protesters. But in the end, those guys did not die. So technically, it's true that they haven't really killed a single protester in, during the law, law enforcement and procedures, but thousands of people have been beaten with broken bones and uh, breathing brains. And then we all know that because, uh, 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 because doctors and nurses already in, in August last year began to protest Hong Kong police attempts to kill, to murder Hong Kong citizens. And the police would also arrest uh, protesters at hospitals. And therefore, doctors and nurses and first aid people would then form this underground support network, but with thousands of injuries. And we don't really know the actual number because this was really not on the books. But then at the same time, what I also want to say is that the Hong Kong crackdown is both more the tenement and less the tenement. It's more the tenement in the sense that the, the suppression in China, inside China after the, tenement, after the tenement crackdown has been so successful that many people are willing to forget about it. And, and, and so now if Beijing wants to get rid of these troublemakers, the rest defense lawyers, you would have hundreds of them. So 
uh, in 2015, on July 9th, that Beijing had one big sweep of all the race defense lawyers, 250 or so, uh, some of those. You can put them all in jail in one sweep. Whereas in Hong Kong, you have the majority of the population who want to have some sense of resistance to Beijing's continued encroachment, who also have developed an increasingly distinctive sense of identity that we are Hong Kongers. So how do you suppress the majority? This makes Hong Kong more like Xinjiang and Tibet than the rest of China, the, uh, uh, um, Shanghai or Beijing or, or Shenzhen. But Hong Kong can also be less than tenement like. One is that the efforts to impose amnesia on Hong Kong, the efforts to, to destroy the truth will be so much harder in Hong Kong because the civil society is very organized. Different professionals are very, very well organized. And, and you have also very strong will uh, to continue to resist even when people now these days don't dare to go protest anymore. And then another very important point is Hong Kong's international status. Now this takes me to the last point. What you know you guys could do. It's great that you know we have this seminar. It's great that people are paying attention to Hong Kong. It is very important for educators to talk about Hong Kong when you go back to go back to your own classroom. The, the among the arrested in Hong Kong, the youngest is 11 years old. And then um, among those who are arrested under the national security law, the youngest is 15. And among the 12 who were trapped and essentially uh, extradited to, to, to Shenzhen behind the scene by the police because of this trap, the youngest is 17 years old. We have a lot of teenagers who are suffering in the hands of the Hong Kong police. And so it is very important that then the other peers, other teenagers in this country also pay attention to what is going on with these other teenagers. What are they up to? What did they want? Why would they risk their lives? Why would they want to leave and flee their own country? You know, they flee their home, their home city. And then another thing that's also very important is I was just uh, listening to actually there have been a lot of these discussions what the world could do for Hong Kong because of the possibility the criminal charge of collusion so someone like me because I criticize the national security law I can no longer go home and then a lot of people who are still in Hong Kong they don't really dare speak out and forming any kind of formal connections could be very dangerous but what one thing that people can do it's for example, I mentioned that a teacher got to certify just for so, you know, trying to get students to think about free speech, what it means, and how far you can go. Can you advocate independence? And got fired, got decertified. But you have teachers of Hong Kong, you have, there's also this, this um, joint effort, for example, by American Teachers Union or European Teachers Union, UN organization that focuses on teachers. If every one of these professional groups get together to reach out to Hong Kong's teachers union, that would give them a much better boost and also make this the regime less excuse to crack down on them than if it is, you know, the US government reaching out to say something. And then another thing is this, this global solidarity to pay attention to the 12 who are detained in Shenzhen and support congressional acts Last year, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was passed. Early this year, the Auto Hong Kong Autonomy Act was passed. But there are still things that, that are still on the agenda is that um, the Hong Kong Democracy Council is trying to push for the People and Choice, Hong Kong People and Choice Act, which would give asylum and refugee, refugee status to Hong Kongers who managed to free Hong Kong and come to the US. And then we, at the same time, we can also get, you know, whoever the candidates are, whoever, which, whichever candidates you support, ask them to pledge support for Hong Kong. And ask questions if you happen to be in one of the town halls, email them questions, where, she, where do you stand on Hong Kong? And then there's also this effort to boycott Beijing Olympics. Now, Beijing wants 
for, for Beijing, the, the whole idea of one country, two systems is not what Hong Kong people thought. Using Hong Kong systems to protect Hong Kong against the, the one party dictatorship, but rather to enjoy Hong Kong's capitalism, its special status, and yet take away its freedom. Yet there are concerted efforts to tell Beijing that if you kill Hong Kong's freedom, you also cannot be benefits from Hong Kong's autonomous status. That there cannot be capitalism without freedom. That capitalism and freedom have to go together. And this message can be sent very powerfully and with solidarity. That may also help people in Hong Kong. So I talked a lot, so let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Hui, for a very thought provoking presentation. So with the conclusion of the presentation portion of the program, we'll now move into our question and answer session. So as a reminder, please type your questions into the Q&A box. So I see we have, um, we have a couple, we have a handful of questions to start out and um, I'll start but the first one uh, from uh, Bruno, I apologize, Bruno Boucher, I hope I pronounced your name correct. He asks, are there similarities in between the security laws in Hong Kong and the Patriot Act and extraterritorialities of American laws? Now that's a tough question for me to ask because I don't know the US laws very well. But what is important to understand is that the Hong Kong national security law is aimed at not just about, you know, really pro pro protecting the national interest. It is really about Beijing's, the, the party, ruling party's own regime security. That it sees Hong Kong, it does not see that Hong Kong people are really just trying to defend the freedoms that have been promised to them, but that seeing the freedoms that Hong Kong people enjoy is a challenge to the regime. And therefore, it has to, you know, many people would, would, would argue that, yeah, you, you, if there are violent protesters that should be cracked down on, that should really be, be repressed. But at the same time, the, the Hong Kong national security law really is aimed at silencing the opposition altogether. Another thing is I kind of skip over earlier in that even actually the violence turn in the protest last year, in a way that I talk about, you know, several uh, tenement-like elements. One of those is the fomentation of bias. Last year, on July 1st, uh, 2019, some protesters, they broke into the Legislative Council building and they did graffiti. And one of those slogans really got, really got stuck in, among the rest of the protesters. It is you, Carrie Lam, the chief executive, who taught us that peaceful forms of protest do not have any effect. And with that sentiment, that also then, now the reason that they said that is because Hong Kong people didn't really start protesting only last year. Hong Kong people, as I said, is a city of protest every year for ever, ever, ever since 1989, Hong Kong people have been protesting every year on all of those anniversaries, but they could never get more democracy. And therefore, this is why there was a sentiment. But with that sentiment, it also gave the regime the excuse to then stir up this, uh, just, just give this sentiment on a bit more um, of a push. And so on July 21st, there were people desecrating the national anthem outside Beijing's office, a uh, representative office in Hong Kong. And people were also pulling down the Chinese national flag and then setting it to on fire and all that. Um, but once protesters began to use their own, to throw their bricks and, and stones and Molotov cocktail, that gave the, the, the authorities a lot of excuses, a lot of room. I would say that when we saw the escalation of radicalization that we saw in by September, October, November, that I've been collecting information, a lot of those basically looked very suspicious. For example, um, do you know, the whole fire station, the whole, whole train station was set on fire. But when these, these train, the train service would just be stopped any time that the protests would begin and only riot police would be at these stations. Who would be there to set fire, to do all the vandalism? So, so the, there are a lot of these issues that we have to look at. And, and so I don't know the details of, the, of, the, of some of these laws in the US, but 
I would say that if there is actually true infringement of free speech, rather than actual violence acts, then you get a lot of opposition. You get a lot of complaints. Okay, next question. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, can you please re-summarize how the national security law affects the judicial system in Hong Kong? The journalists must be registered. What has happened to the judges? Good, thank you. So that with the judges, as I so one, I would like to say that there are these different pillars of freedom in Hong Kong. The different pillars, the judiciary is very important. And then you also have educators, you have medical workers, different profession, the free press, and, and, this, and the impartial police force and the impartial civil service. All of those, actually a lot of those pillars have been eroded. The one last remaining was, as of last year, was the judiciary, the pillar, the judiciary, judiciary pillar. So when last year, when the government announced that they were going to, to introduce a law to extradite people wanted by Beijing from Hong Kong to mainland China, for that, Hong Kong people saw it as kind of the last step because if you take down the judiciary pillar of freedom, there'll be nothing left to protect Hong Kong from the rest of China. And, 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 and so, but then over the time, over, over the years, so after the umbrella movement of 2014, the government already began to appoint a lot of these loyalist judges. If you know, basically the good guys, we're going to appoint them, we're going to promote them. And the guys who seem to be too impartial and too professional, we're going to sideline them and marginalize them. And with this system in mind, this is why last year that I said that the polls knew that, that they could not trust the judiciary to punish every single one of those that the police had arrested. And therefore, they beat up the protesters, they arrested and tortured them. At the same time, with the national security law, they are setting up a special court that the executive now handpicks only a few trusted judges to serve on the national security court. And that court, it does not have to grant bail to the arrested. It does not have to allow uh, uh, a judgment, judgment by jury. It does not even have to open these proceedings. So things can be conducted in secret. And they can also decide to, to refer certain cases uh, to mainland jurisdiction. So this, these, all these developments are super, super scary. Essentially, if you cannot completely tear down, you know, chop down the pillar, the judiciary pillar, you erode it you build a different pillar right next to it to hollow out the original pillar. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question. Um, is the listing of Chinese companies such as Alibaba on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange another preemptive strike by the CCP or the Chinese Communist Party? Well, thank you for asking about Alibaba. So when I talk about you know the encroachment on, free, on the free press in Hong Kong, one the things we know is that Chinese money has been buying up a lot of the Hong Kong's uh, uh, traditional, traditionally mainstream media. Many Hong Kong used to be the city where every single international media organization was set up their regional headquarters in. That Hong Kong itself had tens of newspapers. That was when I was growing up. And these days, all the pre-existing newspapers, every single one except Depo Daily, was bought by mainland interest. Uh, the, the, the Hong Kong used to have two TV stations. One closed down. Another one was also bought by mainland interest. There was another guy who wanted to get a license for a third uh, TV station. He said that I'm just going to provide entertainment, nothing political. Still, uh, the authorities did not like to have anything independent that's outside of the control. So, so Alibaba, the fact that Alibaba actually is that also uh, Jack Ma bought the SCMP, the South China Morning Post, Hong Kong's most reputable English language newspaper uh, several years ago. That is also very significant. Now, of course, that the SCMP is only a very small chunk of the uh, Alibaba empire. And um, Alibaba several years ago could not be listed in Hong Kong because Hong Kong had this rule that that's, you know, the, the big bosses, the big shareholders should not be able to have more than you know, uh, uh, one, share, one vote per share, whereas the New York Stock Exchange will allow that. And then Hong Kong changes rule afterwards. And at the same time, because um, the US administration 
administration these days have been issuing all these warnings about against mainland companies especially technology and financial companies and so there are a lot of interest to list them in hong kong and this goes back to what i was saying earlier that beijing still wants to take advantage of hong kong's capitalism special status but, but yet wants to kill its freedom do we really want beijing to have the cake and eat it too and then at the same time if Beijing really kills kills Hong Kong, then how much how much is left? Um, now Beijing, the China's economy has really taken over the world more or less, but yet its stock exchanges are not doing very well because you can produce, you can manufacture, you can do many things, but when you want to create a really good financial market, ultimately you need to have trust. You really need to have an open economy. And Shenzhen and Shanghai don't have that. Only the Hong Kong Stock Exchange still has that. But Beijing is on the way to killing the Hong Kong Stock Exchange too. The next question, which I think is a very interesting follow-up, is would you say that the one country, two systems is over at this point? Yes, I would definitely say that we have seen the end of the one country, two systems model. And um, so kind of going back to what I said earlier, that in my naive youth in the 1980s, we thought that one country, two systems was meant to use to guarantee Hong Kong's freedoms, to protect Hong Kong from China's one party dictatorship. But all along, Beijing actually meant that to the two systems refer to Hong Kong capitalism and China socialism. And so ultimately, uh, if China can catch up with the with, with the Hong with the Hong, Hong Kong's economic status level, then China would not really need Hong Kong anymore, and this is what we are seeing today. And but yet the end of one country two systems is one thing. Why we have people around the world still trying to say to save Hong Kong, help Hong Kong? The Hong, Hong Kong is not just a place. It's not just about the one country two systems model. It's also about the people. It's also about a place where many people call home. And so the spirit is there. The fighting spirit is there. So this is why we want to give these people a hand. Okay. Next question. Can a scholar get in trouble for studying a politically sensitive topic about China while in Hong Kong? This is a good question because after the announcement of the national security law in, and also because of COVID-19, a lot of the U.S. Uh, university classes are conducted online and with students in Hong Kong and in, in mainland China. So a lot of professors got together and said that, you know, let's just make sure that we do not, we should get together, we should refuse to censor our contents. If there are students who have to be taking courses while in Hong Kong and China, they should just not take your course. We should advise them not to take our course. They should wait until the COVID-19 is taken care of that they can come back to the campus to take these courses, definitely. At the same time, scholars, as I said, I cannot go back home anymore. And many people, I know many people from Hong Kong because they still want to go back because of the job required, because they want to see their family. And therefore um, they hide their identity. You don't put out their faces when they go protest, uh, even in the US. And, and so it is a very scary situation. And the national security law also claims extraterritorial extra jurisdiction. We have the Hong Kong Democracy Council's uh, uh, managing director who does the day to day job involving lobbying the Congress on these bills to protect Hong Kong people. He has been issued an arrest warrant and he's a US citizen. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, this is from one of our educators. Thank you. Um, she says, thank you so much, or he, sorry, he or she or they, thank you so much for the presentation. If I have 15 minutes to explain to my peers the Hong Kong situation and why US college students should care about Hong Kong, what would you suggest that I emphasize? That's a great question. Um, in fact, I probably should learn about that too because so I myself I teach a, a course on contention in China. Uh, traditionally I would just 
talk about all kinds of protests in mainland China and leaving only one day on Hong Kong and Taiwan. But beginning from last year, I changed and giving a lot more room to Hong Kong, but I understand that not everyone can do that. I would focus on, you know, Hong Kong, this city that used to enjoy all kinds of freedoms, people who used to be able, I would make this contrast between the Hong Kong I grew up in and the Hong Kong that we are facing today and the kind of teenagers who are the forefront of protests what are they up to? Why, why would they be willing to sacrifice everything, risk the future, or see that they have no future? This is why they're willing to, to sacrifice their lives to defend the freedom that's been promised to them. And what that means to you, know, you the 15 year old sitting in this room. Okay, next question. How are foreigners, teachers who teach ESL, and teachers and missionaries treated in Hong Kong? Uh, so these days, a lot of the um, churches, church leaders, they are getting very worried and they've also become very silent because these days, anyone who criticizes the national security law, you, you may not get arrested easily, but what I would call soft repression is people get fired. So teachers get decertified, uh, uh, civil servants get fired, and, and then at the same time, um, it's just the, it's this total blanket of fear, and that has been relatively successful. And it is a scary thing, but at the same time, that there's still quite a, a lot of, if we, we talk to people, they really do not want to give up. A lot of people want to fight, but then many do not want to leave, they want to stay and fight. And even among those who want to leave, they actually still want to leave. They want to leave so that they can still continue to struggle. And that is an important message that we also want to, to pass on. Could you talk a little bit about foreigners? Yeah, so the foreigners in, so, so let's, let's put it one, uh, one it, it this way, is that one time that I um, had another webinar and there were and, uh, one of the, there were several hosts and one of them was still in Hong Kong. And I said, well, is this event broadcast live? Was it going to be live stream? And then he said, yes. And then uh, I said, maybe it is not very safe for you to show your face if you're still in Hong Kong, you still want to travel in Hong Kong, you still want to be able to fly out of Hong Kong safely. And that person took my advice. So uh, there's still a lot of foreigners in Hong Kong who continue to talk about it. There are still, many, again, people can people really, in the, the, one of the many reasons why Hong Kong is not dead, even though one country, two systems is dead, is many people continue to do whatever we've been doing. And so that includes foreigners as well as a church leaders. But it, everyone cal has to calculate his or her risk. Okay. Now you have uh, two questions. Of her. Thank you, Kellis Wong, for, for posting. Um, uh, Kellis is a Hong Kong journalist and uh, comments that journalists who work in Hong Kong do not need to be licensed or registered, unlike our counterparts in China. So that's the first comment. And now the question, um, the national security law uh, makes political activism a criminal offense. So could you share what kind of actions in a classroom might fall under the definition of political activism? And how likely is it for students in the US whether or not they have family members living in Hong Kong and mainland China, will they, will they be affected by this law for discussing or learning about the Hong Kong protests? Okay, so it, this is, so first of all, in Hong Kong, that um, the police say that, you know, even under the new regulations, not law, it's just police regulations that when whenever that they go out to have, they, when they have police operations, whenever there's a protest, they go there and then just draw the cotton line and check everyone within the line, you know, what are you up to? Are you a protester? Do you possess any weapons? What to take down your ID? And if you happen to be one of the permitted mainstream pro racial media these days, you'll be let go. You don't have to, you're not subject to, you know, the searches and questioning. But if you uh, if you happen to work for the Apple Daily, if you happen to work for a web-based news site, and there are multiple web-based uh, news sources in Hong Kong these days, they're all pro-democracy, then you will be treated as just one of the protesters. 
and or or maybe if you're lucky, you're treated as it passes by. Just even if you're not arrested, you have all the information taken taken down. And then another thing is, what could you actually? What kind? You know, if the, does the national security law criminalize all kinds of political activism? I think the another thing we want to also emphasize is that the national security law criminalizes not just action. So you know, setting up roadblocks is an action, but it also criminalizes activity, which means that you could just be uh, driving that guy to the site, and you could be criminalized. Or you happen to have sold, uh, I don't know, a pile of materials to that person. You could also get yourself into trouble. Or you have uh, provided office space for that person to stock up the stuff in, in preparation for the roadblock. So, so, and or you have provided training. So any of, the, any of these would count as activity. The definition of the law is meant to be so fake that people self-censor. So it is true that if you want to be very cautious, then everyone should exercise self-censorship and don't say anything. And so for people who, really, who want to be very cautious, I just why that in that with that webinar because it was live stream and then that person was still sitting in Hong Kong and that person was also putting up his the company logo. So he decided to take this all down. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we also know that the police have these prime targets. So Jimmy Lai, the publisher of the Apple Daily is one of the prime targets. There are lots of activists that they're going after. They are trying to collect information. They are really going after Jimmy Lai, raiding his offices multiple times because they want to arrest him, charge him for the national, under the national security law, but they don't know what exactly is done. And so therefore they are doing all of this fishing, raiding exercises. And so if you are just, just happen to be one of those sitting in the classroom, maybe it won't get to you. And I think a lot of people that I, I know, they said that, you know, I'm just going to continue to do whatever I do. Maybe I'm going to, if I'm a teacher, I'll continue to talk about all of these incidents. You just be a lot more careful. Now, what is also important to keep in mind is that the, now the education secretary, the, the, the department's head, he's even telling, these teachers and students and parents to report on teachers. So it means that you can't even trust your own students. You cannot trust your fellow workers, your fellow teachers, because the people are encouraged to report on one another. That's a classic case of divide and rule, using the dominated to dominate one another. That makes it so much easier because you cannot really keep an eye on every single individual in Hong Kong. Um, so that, but then there's still room for people to could maintain the level of awareness. And this is why I said earlier that Hong Kong is less the Tiananmen in the sense that it's just going to be immensely difficult to surveil everyone, to impose amnesia, to make people forget the truth, to tell people to spy on one another. It's just going to be a lot harder in Hong Kong. And does that strengthen, I mean, I know the question also raised the point of classrooms like in the United States and outside of Hong Kong and people that are participating in these discussions and, and providing you know, balanced perspective of both Beijing and Hong Kong. Um, I think that was part of the question that was being answered as well is, you know, for those, those um, Hong Kong students that are studying abroad and the concerns they might have about their, their families and friends and um, relatives, colleagues that are still in Hong Kong. And you yourself mentioned that you cannot return to Hong Kong. And I'm, I'm sure people, you know, question about your family and your friends and all of that. So I think that that, that was definitely a question about um, in the United States, the concerns that uh, people that might have. Yeah, so thank you again for reminding me that, so um, the, as I said, the professors got together and issued these guidelines that we should not self-censor ourselves. So it's not just me, it's a whole bunch of political scientists who all t teach about China got together and agreed to a general set of guidelines and, and tell the students that if you're going to be zooming in the class, in my class from China or Hong Kong, then don't take it. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it is very important that um, it, there's also another term that people have taught, looked at, China's shock power. It's not about using, you know, it's not about beating people up or putting a gun at your head to tell you to, to shut up. 
but it is using all kinds of other non-military forms of coercion, coercive measures to silence people, even overseas. And Beijing has been very successful because in many cases that it controls the, the purse. So Hollywood has been silencing itself, has been trying to cater to the, the main and Chinese market and not criticizing China. But if we, I mean, big, business, big businesses, they have, they're accountable to their shareholders, but we professors, we are accountable to our students. And I think that it's not just me. So I think that a lot of colleagues in the U across the US are thinking that we have to stick to our national uh, professionalism as well. Thank you. Um, we have uh, one more question, but please, if there, we still have some time, if there are other people that would like to type in a question in the Q&A box, please do. And I think this is a, a very interesting way to potentially end because it's 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 reminding us of different different views of so how is the national security law viewed by the majority of mainland residents? I think that's a very interesting question. So thank you, Anya Yada, for submitting that question. This is a, a very good question because a lot of mainland Chinese that I you know they believe that it is necessary. Um, in Hong Kong, there's also this divide this, that the, those who, are, who support democracy are called yellow, uh, those who so support the regime are called blue. So there's also this yellow versus blue divide among Hong Kong people as well. But what is also interesting is that, uh, so let, let me go through this because in a way that the, the, I, in my answer can be more elaborated one because I still see that I have a few minutes, but also that is something that I have thought a lot about. So last year, when I was, when, you know, before all of those uh, talks and webinars got canceled. So now that we are all used to doing webinars, but before, so from September to March, I was talking, I was, I was giving a talk uh, at least once a week at every, at many different universities and sometimes two, two talks a week. And I love that because it gave me this engagement with mainland students because Hong Kong students at every single campus, is, we're talking about five versus hundreds of mainland students. So I would get to talk to a lot of mainland students. So I really know what mainland students think that Hong Kong protests turn violent and therefore they deserve this, that the, the regime had no choice but to introduce the national security law. So in my talk, I was already in my you know a speech earlier. I was already talking about the, why this is, view is wrong because it is true that the protests were escalating and radicalizing last year, but by the district council elections of November twenty fourth last year, things quieted down. People want to turn to actually try to, to concentrate the energy on how they could win the legislative council uh, on the. the at the scheduled elections on September 6th before it was canceled and before people, many democracy candidates were disqualified. And two, people also learned the lesson that if you want to have any kind of, uh, you want to keep the protest sustainable, you can't have people always coming out to block trees, so, you know, and, and people throwing bricks and stones, that was just not going to go anywhere. So you have professionals, moderates, taking over the movement by January. And, they, and these different professions, teachers, lawyers, uh, architects, uh, medical workers, all kinds of professionals were organizing in, in unions. And the number of registration of new unions jumped up phenomenally uh, in, in early this year. And it, the problem then is, and oh, oh and another thing is also COVID-19 gave the regime excuse to essentially shut down every kind of protest. So by early, by early this year, there was really no excuse, no reason for why you would need something so draconian to silence the protests, to calm down the protests. So this is one thing. And two, earlier I said that the, the point about, you know, that the, the national security law is targeted to only a small minority of violent protesters. Well, what, now we know that it really is targeted at silencing any kind of free speech. If people get arrested for even protesting with blank sheets of paper, we don't know where's it going to be banned. So we're just going to protest with blank sheets of paper. If these people also arrested, you know, what's left of free speech in Hong Kong. Another point is that, yes, there were these, um, the protests turned violent, 
I as actually one of those. So if you check all the public statements I've made, is that I've always championed nonviolence. I was actually very surprised by the turn to violence. One, I thought when I saw that the first day, I thought they're going to completely lose popular support because Hong Kong people have such low threshold for violence. It didn't turn out that way. That the popular support or tolerance or understanding of protesters turned to throw rocks and, and stones and Molotov cocktail at police officers, it was actually relatively high. Why? In hindsight, it was obvious because people saw that it was the police using very, very excessive violence. And so one of the demands, independent investigation into police abuse consistently enjoy about 80% of public support. So while Hong Kong people felt that, you know, it was not good, that, you know, not a good idea to involve any kind of damage to human property, the human lives or, or just property, but, but still they were like, well, you know, nothing seemed to be able to compel any concession from the, this government. What, what could they do? And so that was the kind of sentiment. And I think that that is also a very important message that people have to understand that at the same time, then we also could see that a lot of those, uh, the most violent forms of protest, I can actually provide, provide a report of, you know, all the, a lot of those cases were really, really mysterious. Uh, it's very, it, it's kind of unbelievable that they could be done by protesters because, you know, when stations were shut down, you know, the only people who could be around were just police officers. So, yes, um, to go back to the question, a lot of mainlanders do support this, but I would also say that there's one very important thing that uh, there's a study by Chinese university mainland students. So mainland students studying at Chinese university, they conducted a survey. I was so surprised by their survey results that it was an even split. I was expecting to see in basically one-sided uh, 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 responses, but then the, they, a lot of these students understood, actually the more that they, ha they hang out with local students, the more that they interacted with local students, the more that they could speak Cantonese, the more that they identify with Hong Kong's values and the importance to maintain one country, the systems and Hong Kong's freedoms and rights, the more that they also show understanding of the protest. So the even split among mainland students at Chinese university, that was very illuminating to me. That is a very interesting point. And I think it's a reminder that even though uh, the mainland Chinese government likes to remind us that there's, you know, one, one country, you know, but there are many, many, many different views within China. And it's an interesting note. Do you know what university that was? It's Chinese university, the one in uh, the New Territories. Uh, 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 that, oh, sorry, Chinese university, <laughs> understood. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Professor Hui. Um, and thank you, our audience, for joining us tonight. Um, we hope that you found this presentation to be informative and we look forward to hosting you at our future events. Your feedback is important to us. It helps us to craft program that is relevant and impactful for education about international topics. So we ask that all audience members, please visit the link provided now in the chat box to complete a very brief evaluation. I promise it's very brief. We will also email all attendees a reminder about this evaluation. And we thank you in advance for your support. So next up in our International Education Conference webinar series is an event that takes place on Monday, October 26th at 6 p.m. We have Nadir Hashemi of the University of Denver who will present on social <laughs> protests, democracy, and authoritarianism in the Middle East. So for more information and to register for this event, please visit the link provided in the chat box again now. And with that, I wish you all a very good night. A thank you again, Professor Hui. I wish all of you be well and stay well. Thank you. <laughs>